Welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast, where today's brightest minds in the medical device industry go to get their most useful and actionable insider knowledge, direct from some of the world's leading medical device experts and companies. On this episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast, I catch up with Renee Van de Zand. Renee is with Med Envoy Global. You can check out more about Med Envoy, medenvoyglobal.com. But the topic we talk about is the role of the importer now that EUMDR is in effect. The rules have changed a little bit. The expectations, the criteria, the obligations of that importer are pretty important, especially with respect to managing post-market surveillance, labeling, translation. Lots of things that are really important to factor in when you're choosing importers. And this is a service that Med Envoy Global provides. So enjoy this episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast. This is your host and founder at Greenlight Guru, John Spear. Joining me today is Renee Van de Zan. He is the Renee. What is your title? I know you're with Med Envoy, but I guess I should have asked you that I... before I hit record. No, not a problem at all. So I'm one of the partners within Met Envoy as well as the commercial director. Okay. And a lot of folks may know you from Amergo fame, and we, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that at some point in time, but you've been in this space a long time. I mean, you know, as far as medical device regulations and understanding the nuances, and one of the topics that's confusing, I think, especially now that EU MDR is live, is the role of the importer. And thought we could dive into that a little bit today. Yeah, very good. Happy to discuss that uh, with you and the listeners. All right. Well, I know when the EU MDR, when that was first made available to those of us in the industry a few years back now, this whole idea of economic operators was introduced and it was kind of a, at least for me, a head scratcher. You know, of course, I've worked with authorized reps and importers and, and so on and so forth over the years, but the EU MDR sort of changed things for a lot of these economic operators. So I guess that might be a great place to start, you know, specifically with sure. respect to the importer. Why does this matter with respect to the EU MDR. Yeah, I think just as a general introduction, obviously, yeah, the MDR has kept us busy for quite a long time. And it's such a major overhaul, obviously, of directives that we felt pretty comfortable with in the industry. Yeah. And then, of course, because of a variety of reasons, including a fraud event that took place in France, obviously, the rest is history, right? right. So that is uh, so it's here and it's here to stay. There are no delays, at least not for the MDR. And since May 26, it's alive and kicking. So there we are. And I think with regard to the role of the economic operators, as you mentioned, the authorized representative is a well-known operator. The economic operator, well-defined, but that didn't happen overnight. If we all recall in the early stages of the MDD and the IBD, um, the role of the authorized representative was not as well-defined as it is today. So it took time. And I think we're going to see something similar with the importer. However, I don't think it's going to take that long. It takes years yeah. before we see a guidance coming out what exactly the role of the authorized representative is. So that to set the frame a little bit. I also think it's, as a result, it's kind of new. The MDR, I think the overall intent of the regulator has been to ensure within the supply chain, there's proper traceability of the devices. I think that was a challenge under the MDD, that it was not always clear when there were vigilance events, recalls, that devices were clearly tracked. So I think that is one thing. The other thing is just to put extra checks and balances into the supply chain to ensure that devices are compliant. And particularly the role of the importer is a critical one because there are only two of the economic operators that can be held responsible for placing a device on the market. That is either a legal manufacturer that resides in the European Union, or it is actually Actually, the importer and mm -hmm. all the economic other economic operators, they are the only one that can do it. That is important because placing on the market you know, brings brings quite a bit of heavy weight, I think, on the shoulder of this particular economic operator as an importer. Yeah. And we could talk about that, of course, in more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I just remember in quite a few years ago, way before UMDR went into effect, when the directives were still the law of the land, so to speak, you know, I worked, worked with quite a few U.S.-based companies who were, you know, of course, interested in the EU market. And, you know, they built relationships with some of the importers and some were better than others. And I know in some cases, we would try to have quality agreement in place with the importer that defined our responsibility as the manufacturer and their responsibility as the importer. And to your point, you know, being able to make maintain records of where devices were distributed and be a point of contact if in, in the event that there were some issues or adverse events and things of that nature. And some of these importers, you know, just told us to pound sand. And it's like, man, that was frustrating because what do you do, you know? And I guess this is promising now that things are shifting a little bit, but I can imagine that this is creating quite the stir in the EU. I mean, there's been a lot of companies that have been serving in that role of importer for quite some time, probably that don't have the systems in place in order to do that. So, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing? 
Exactly. And of course, then the role of importer or is kind of directly linked to the distributors, because I think those and those are always considered to be one and the same. And actually, under the MDR, they could be if there is no particular importer identified by a legal manufacturer outside the EU who is going to take on the role of importer and the respective obligations, as these are clearly stipulated in the MDR under Article 13 for the importer itself. So yes, in the old days, the MDD times, the distributors were also often importers. But now this, because the MDR has now clearly defined who is who in the supply chain when it comes to economic operators. And although there is a very clear overlap in the activities that you'll see, the obligations, if you look at Article 13, the obligation of the importer, compare that with the obligations of an authorized representative, as well as from a distributor in Article 14 and your Article 11, respectively, for the authorized representative, there is an overlap. So I think that was intentional. But I think from a, a company perspective, responsible for managing and kind of controlling your supply chain, and then the obligations that you now suddenly have as an importer or a distributor, because the authorized representative, as I said earlier, they are really quite aware of their responsibilities, even though they don't like the fact that they're jointly responsible for defective devices, which is yeah. one of the reasons also why some of these economic operators do not want to be an importer. To your question, this is kind of a little bit disturbed. One, I think the manufacturer, legal manufacturer outside the EU is starting to realize that these responsibilities are critical to them when it comes to managing their supply chain, because it can come to hunt them if these economic operators obviously are not aware of their responsibilities. The authorized mm -hmm. representative has a written mandate. It's clearly stipulated that you must have one if you don't have a place of business in the EU. So that's clear. Now, from an importer selection perspective or allocation, the MDR does not specify in states that you must have an importer. But what is going to happen is that if you don't have an importer as a legal manufacturer outside the EU, you don't appoint one or multiple because it's not with the authorized representative. You can have multiple importers taking on that role and that obligation. If you don't manage that, that means that by de facto, other economic operators like the importer, or the distributor, even the authorized representative potentially, uh, or wow. for example, a 3PL, a logistics provider, could mm -hmm. become de facto the importer. And that is challenging because, or that could lead to challenges for the legal manufacturer, since they are responsible for post-market surveillance, for tracking of their devices as well, even though each economic operator has its own responsibility based on their obligations from a tracking perspective, it still is challenging. So for a manufacturer to say, I'm going to just let this go, I don't really care, it's not my responsibility, that is a little too easy to say. And I think the industry is realizing that. Now, when we speak to distributors, there are, I would say there are three kinds of distributors, right? There's one that says, sure, I'll take on this role of right. importer as well. You want to double check that because distributors in nature, which they are, they're sales organizations. They love, right. love to do anything they want to do as long as they can sell your products. So they'll take it. So you have to be a little bit more cautious and really determine that that's the case. Then you have the distributor who will say, you know what, we can handle this. And they may be because they are, they're a good outfit. They understand already their own obligations as distributor under Article 14. There's quite a bit of overlap. And they'll say, we'll take it on. And they have the capability as well. And then you have the importer, sorry, the distributor who says, absolutely not. We do mm -hmm. not want to take on this role. You know, there's the placement of the market responsibility, right? It's directly linked to an importer. They don't want to take on that extra liability. The same can be said for an authorized representative. As I said earlier, they don't like to defect jointly responsibility for defective devices. Don't add now also responsibility for placing on the market on the uh, authorized representative. Right. So that all in all, to summarize, it's definitely something that a legal manufacturer outside the EU needs to reckon with and decide how they're going to manage this. Then there is the identification, right? You need to identify the importer, like we see with the authorized representative, on the labeling. Now, there are options similar to the authorized representative, right? They can put it on the device label or the device, the device label, packaging label, and right. or add the instructions for use. Now, the importer goes one step further. can also say it could be information provided or that accompanies the device. And there is definitely a, a lot of gray area about yeah. what is exactly meant by that. Is that a device slip or an invoice? Is it a packaging slip or is it the IAVU? That, so we believe coming out of the industry, and again, that is just a pain right now and a belief. I think down the road, we'll see more guidance exactly what is intended and what is meant by the regulator and where they would where would they like to see the importer identified. But we believe it is as deep as possible into the supply chain, most likely okay. all the way up to the end user. Then, of course, an invoice or a packaging slip may not be the best solution. But for now, manufacturers or let's say importers, you'll have the options where to place or identify it. Again, in the context of your question, that helps
helps the manufacturers also to think about it because distributors, right, they can be obviously importer as well, but most companies tend to have multiple distributors in the, in, right. in the, in the channels. So as a result of that, how are you going to manage that? So that's more a practical issue. So that's one thing to reckon with. Are you better off with selecting an importer that solely is going to take on that role? Because when you think about importer, we all know, first thing we think about importers, well, they obviously take products from A and to B, right? They bring it into the market. They also think about, okay, there's the fiscal responsibility as well with VAT right. when you get into Europe. So those flows, the physical flow of, the, of products into the market and the fiscal flow, that's all clearly understood. But now with the MDR, there is this clear Article 13 with the obligation of an importer that is added to it. So I think as a manufacturer, you do need to think a little bit about how to manage it since it has a consequence if it's not managed properly or not controlled properly. Okay. A couple of thoughts. You know, the first thought is pre-EU MDR, I assume that there were importers that existed, but me as med device company, I may not have had to formally designate an, an importer. I may have relied on, on a distributor. Is that an accurate statement? Well, the importer was not as clearly defined as it okay. is under the MDR, so because okay. now it has clearly defined obligations under Article 30. That did not exist. Okay. The importer did exist, of course, uh, if you look at the Blue Guide, right, which yeah. is a great reference tool to understand some of the terminology in regulations and directives on an EU level. Of course, always has spoken of an importer and who is an importer. And there is also confusion about that because initially a lot of people think that an importer needs to take title of the product right, mm. or need to take physical possession. The Blue Guide is very specific that there doesn't need to be taken title of, of, uh, of the okay. So right now the MDR, what it has done, what I said earlier, it has really identified economic operators in the supply chain with each has their respective obligations. Quite a few of them are overlapping mm -hmm. with the intent of traceability of devices as well ensuring the device are compliant. And the first person or the first economic operator, right? If you are a legal entity outside the EU is the importer and the designated importer, as you mentioned it technically, it's right now, that is not how it is interpreted that you must designate an importer because it becomes de facto if you do not have one. I see. I think I've been trying to explain the best as I can that a manufacturer really needs to consider to designate an importer. Yeah, which kind of all the reasons that I just mentioned. Which kind of leads me to the next question that I had. You talked about, because me as med device company pre-MDR, I definitely needed distributors in place in order to, especially if I'm outside the EU, to distribute my product to point of view. So if, if this is new or news to me, then I may say, oh, well, I've already got my distributors. And to your point, that you know, there's kind of three flavors, if you will, of distributor. The distributor says, no way, I'm not taking on that responsibility of importer. One that says, sure, happy to do so, and I'm willing to comply and adhere to all the new rules and regulations. And the third that says, yeah, sure, we'll do it, but they don't know what they don't know. I guess, you know, from a company perspective who you know, maybe say, oh, well, I've already got my distribution channels all defined. And so what sort of due diligence or qualification or audits or, or you know, that sort of activity, what should I be doing as a manufacturer if I want to keep the importer role with a distributor? Is an audit necessary? Should I ask for some sort of credentials or certification? What should I be asking? for? Well, it depends on which country the distributor resides, you may want to do an audit. If it's Italy, Spain, great countries to visit, right? But I don't think that should be the deciding <laughs> factor, whether you, the factor whether you should audit. But no, I do think you need to do proper due diligence, right? First, you need to have map out as a company who is who within your supply chain. So if you have multiple distributors, okay, what type of quality agreements do you currently have in place with these distributors? Because I presume that you do have those. And then, then make sure that the obligations of the distributor, first and foremost, which is Article 14, are properly addressed and being met, right, in that quality agreement. And if you turn the distributor also as an importer, right, also becomes an importer under Article 13, that that is properly addressed in, in the quality agreement as well. So that is one way of doing it. Now, to, you want to make sure that they have proper processes, procedures, right, from a quality system perspective that they have in place because a distributor is also responsible, right, for tracking of the devices. So you want to make sure that that is addressed in that quality management system. The distributor, of course, is also the front line of potential receiving complaints right? And those need to be addressed properly, which in most cases already was addressed in the quality agreement under the MDD. But again, something to really now focus on and make sure it's addressed because it's strongly emphasized now, particularly if you turn your distributor also in an importer, it's a double whammy, right? Now two articles of obligations under the MDR are going to apply, Article 13 and 14. So that's that. I think those are critical. So the PMS part of it, post-market surveillance, vigilance, complaint handling, all of those processes that are obviously are a place 
on the manufacturer's perspective, also you want to make sure that the distributor have that in place. So it's all connected because as I said earlier, this is obviously part of the critical intent of why these economic operators have been clearly identified and have each specified obligations is with regard to traceability of devices and ensuring that devices are compliant when placed on the market. Okay. And from an input, so the only thing that the consideration that manufacturer still needs to make is, okay, well, how can an importer, right, fulfill its obligations under Article 13, right? It needs to ensure that the product is C compliant. What does that mean? Well, it, mm-hmm. in particularly, it relates to the, the ensuring the products that when placed on the market for the first time, that these are the same devices for which it has identified these products are compliant. It has a C certificate. There's a declaration conformity. The labeling is in order, including the IFUs. Has proper translations been applied? Because as we all know, translations of labeling Huge. is not new. It's not no, new. No, but, but it's still a yeah. big deal though. Very big deal and an expensive deal because it's yeah. also by what time, obviously, do you make an investment in a certain market? And part of that investment is the cost associated with translations. And that has become a very important element under the MDR, as we know, because the MDD was not as specific as the MDR is, right? Where it clearly stipulates that you must ensure that the IFU is in a official union language dictated by the member states where you place the device on the market. And of course, you and I have run into that many times, I'm sure. Yeah, right. That has always been a major challenge. And manufacturers outside the EU, particularly the English speaking, even though we know English is a world language, it doesn't mean that everybody speaks English. So that is one thing. And that perception or that idea that they believe it is, I think they really need to get rid of that idea. So you do really need to do your homework of where you place devices on the market and then identify what the requirements are in those specific markets, right? Because there may be certain markets, countries that allow English only for professional use. I can tell you that not many of them at this time, right? It never has been. So as you know, there's a channel through where you can try to use through derogation, where you ask a member state to allow you to present information or labeling in English only. Not easy to get. So it's definitely an exercise that companies need to go through, particularly with the MDR. We think it's going to be an additional item that really notified bodies and company authorities are going to hammer on, that that is addressed properly. And we all know that companies have you know, SOPs in place that address labeling and document control. But we also know that the enforcement by notified bodies, right, and the company authorities was not that strong, even though, huh? so again, I always like to tell clients, nothing has changed when it comes to the requirements as these exist on a member state level, when it comes to translation of information provided with the device and or labeling, particularly when it's for layperson use, but even for professional use, you need to know what the requirements are on the member state level. And now with the MDR, the difference is that it's been clearly emphasized that you need to take note of that. Secondly, the economic operators, and particularly the importer, has a responsibility to ensure that the labeling is compliant. And with that includes whether you have proper translations done. And this is something we have run into quite a bit, obviously as a meta envoy, but we know our clients are running into, or the manufacturers are running into it as well. So it's back on the radar. It's always been there, but I think now it's something that is hard to try to justify not to translate unless there's a clear mandate given by the member state that you can do so. Okay. Well, Renee, this is a great point to take a short break. I want to remind folks I'm talking with Renee Van de Zand with Med Envoy. You can learn more uh, by visiting Med Envoy Global, all one word, no hyphens or spaces.com, Med Envoy Global.com. Renee, while I'm taking this break, tell folks a little bit about Med Envoy and the types of products and services that you provide. Yeah. So, Med Envoy birth is really a result of the MDR. As my background, you mentioned it in the introduction, I was the former owner, president, CEO of the Murgo Group for many years and uh, sold the company to underwriters laboratories in 2017 and stayed with Emergo by UL through the end of December 2019. And I really thought this is the end of my tenure of almost 30 years being in regulatory compliance. <laughs> and I was going to do something completely different since the, obviously the, I had the opportunity to do so and got into food products and dating apps and all types of software products left <laughs> and right. But you can see it didn't last long. I'm, I'm, I'm back here in my old world, which I do appreciate and actually missed, even though it was maybe six, seven months. So we started Meta Envoy with two other partners, Edgar Castile, who also comes out of Emergo, um, who resides in our Dutch headquarters in The Hague, uh, the Netherlands, and Stefan Tuschen, who was a former managing director and partner with Boston Consultant Group. So I would say three old hands in the industry, <laughs> obviously, got together. And when we looked at the MDR, and particularly at the economic operators, I'm very familiar, of course, with the role of authorized representative, Emergo being a large provider. This also smells like the same thing when I smelled it in the late 90s, that this was an opportunity maybe to provide a service and also an opportunity to provide a solution to the industry because we all know that regulators come up with these great ideas, right, when it comes to safety devices, et cetera, et cetera. But there are 
some practical challenges with it. And I think with Met Envoy, now we have created a service where we offer independent importer service. So different from the authorized representative, different from a distributor, different from a third-party logistics provider who also doesn't like to act as an importer because of place in the market. Sure. And we believe with this service, we allow our clients to really control a little bit more their supply chain. You know, just the commercial challenge that comes along with the role of the importer. If you give that to a distributor, you know, you need to provide certain access to documentation, which can be sensitive, similar to why you would select an independent authorized representative. So we saw this as an opportunity maybe to step in with a company like Meta Envoy. And we developed a service where we believe, we hope it's minimally invasive to the supply <laughs> chain, right, right, of our clients. But we do believe we've developed something that meets the intent of the MDR, and particularly, of course, Article 13, the obligations of the importer. All right. I want to come back to Article 13. You've mentioned that a few times, and I have some questions. But before we do, I also want to remind folks that Greenlight Guru, we have the only medical device success platform on the market designed specifically and exclusively for medical device companies by actual medical device professionals. You know, we help you manage and establish a quality system, things with design and development, including design controls, risk management, as well as documents and record management, all those quality events that you're going to have to manage and maintain throughout the total product life cycle of all your products. I would encourage you to go check it out, www.greenlight.guru. I'll learn more about the platform and the products and services that we offer. And if you want to know if our products and services can meet your specific requirements and needs, just reach out to us, give us a call, shoot us a note. We'd be happy to have a conversation with you to see if we might be able to help. All right. So I want to tell the listeners before I continue to talk, I'm not being paid for this. I just want to make that clear. But <laughs> Greenlight Guru obviously is an excellent company. Um, Matt and Voy also uses Greenlight Guru software platform. Again, me coming from Emergo, obviously a big provider over all those yeah. years in developing and implementing quality management systems. And we always been able to do that without a software tool. And trust me, we ran into it many times that it was time for us to do it. And I'm always amazed that we were able to do it for so long without a software tool. But I know those days are gone. And I generally mean that to any listener, you know, if you are considering quality management system or you have a quality system that is more paper driven, I think it's really time for you to look into a product such as Greenlight Guru because it saves a lot of time and effort and it's also much easier to manage and much more effective. And cloud-based, since a lot of our clients are spread all over the world with vendors left and right, yeah. it absolutely makes sense. So again. Appreciate you saying so. I appreciate that a great deal. I guess that kind of is a great segue to a question that I have. True or false, does an importer have to have a quality management system that complies with 13485 as well as the MDR? Yeah, although it's kind of on the voluntary basis, right? Yeah. You want to go ISO 1345, but no, absolutely. I think if you consider the obligations and how you need to manage and fulfill those obligations, to do that as a distributor and particularly as an importer, you do need to have a good quality management system in place that helps to ensure that devices placed in the market are compliant. So it has a strong verification element to it, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that you're tied into the post-market surveillance part of it and vigilance. When you look at an author's representative, the distributor, but also in particular the importer, they have an obligation to ensure that if there are problems with a, de a device in the market for which they have been responsible for placing the market, that they take appropriate action and that could go all the way up to contacting a competent authority. Mm -hmm. So again, this needs to be streamlined and well organized and managed. So the best way to do that is have a proper process in place. Yeah. And the other thing is that an importer, obviously, as we talked about earlier, is identified uh, somewhere in the supply chain on information to the device. That means it can receive complaints and right. it has clear obligations under Article 30. One, to collect complaints if they do come in. Of course, they have to channel that directly to the right. manufacturer, but they also need to have access to complaint records of their mm. client, right? Or the company that they represent or the device that they represent. Sensitive topic, right? How do you do it? But For again, sure. all these systems, right, are very important that they tie into each other it's directly with the manufacturer side and in your own quality management system. So absolutely, there are a lot of reasons why in order to meet as an importer to your obligations of Article 13, that that should be controlled and organized around a, a robust quality management system. Okay. So my question on the article 13, the importer has to meet the obligations of article 13. Who gets to determine that? Do you as importer get to say, yeah, we went through a checklist and we've done that. Does it require the, the competent authority to say so? Does it require an auditing organization? How do you determine whether or not you as an importer have met those obligations? Yeah. So right now the importer, you know, of course we're going to presume that they will be considered a critical supplier to their customers. I would think so. Yeah. The, the legal manufacturer. So that's one thing. As we talked about, 
about, it doesn't say that you must have ISO 1345, but it definitely talks in the NDR that distributors and importers need to have proper quality systems in place, particularly if they take certain requirements upon them with relation to the devices of the legal manufacturer. So what we think is going to happen, so from an enforcement perspective, it's definitely the competent authorities, maybe notified bodies. We all know notified bodies love to audit. We all know yeah. now they're very busy, so they're yeah. a little bit selective of where they're going to audit, but everything when the dust settles, right, over time. But I think the importer will end up on the critical supply list of the manufacturer that they represent. And then, of course, it's up to the critical or to the legal manufacturer how they are going to inspect them and audit them, right? And if you look at the role of the importer themselves, right, verifying that products placed in the market are compliant, which technically is associated with each shipment, right? Each shipment that enters yeah. into the EU, whether you take physical possession as the importer or not, you still need to go through a verification process, ensuring that the products placed in the market are compliant. So there's a process behind that. And what happens, you know, there's record creation. So it's the importer that needs to show a kind of proof that it's yeah. fulfilling its obligations under Article 30 towards enforcement authorities, right? Could be a notified body, but even more importantly, it's going to be the competent authority. Like a company like us, Metanvoy, we know that at some point in time, we get a knock on the door in The Hague. And it's not far for the Dutch company authority to knock on that door. They can take their bicycle, you know, <laughs> right. and cross the street, right? So that is going to happen. And so that's where really the enforcement will come through. It's obviously, once products are placed on the market, it's up to the competent authorities to check and make sure that the economic operators are fulfilling their obligations. So that's what's going to happen. Okay, that makes sense. The other, a new term that was introduced with the EU MDR is this term person responsible for regulatory compliance or PRRC. I know our industry yes. loves loves our acronyms. So I guess compare and contrast a person responsible for regulatory compliance yeah. and an importer, are these the same entity or are they different? No, they're definitely different. I mean, they all have to do with you know some part of compliance, but the PRRC, depending on the size of your company, obviously is an appointed person or persons within an organization. Okay. So within a legal manufacturer. So often most likely within the RA department and or QA or a combination of the two. Specifically appointed person within an organization that is is really ultimately responsible that compliant from the compliance from an MDR perspective. So it's an important role, it needs to be taken seriously. And the MDR also kind of protects the PRC as a result of it. So it needs to be able to scream, right, to management yeah. if there are issues. It needs to have, you know, the ability to say, you know, we cannot place this product on the market, right? We cannot ship this product. You know, we need to. So it's all of those things. And the company cannot have any repercussions, you know. So they could be a protected whistleblower, right? Without, uh, yes. without ramifications. Yeah. Correct. Of course, the whistleblower is worst case scenario, right? right. Because that is when thing really goes down the drain and, right, and, right. and, and, and the management is, is not taking any proper action. But it's just in, in the normal daily activities of a regulatory affairs person, in this case, the PRC, to ensure that products are compliant. It's in those type of things. It really has quite a bit of leverage and it needs to have given that leverage, that mandate. Mm -hmm. And as at the same time, it needs to also obtain the protection. So the importer at this point does not need to have a PRC, which is a requirement as an authorized representative, right? That's one of the economic operators, the authorized representative, right, right. because, you know, when you compare, even though the importer has some compliance, of course, obligations towards the device and the manufacturer that they may represent, of course, it's the authorized representative has clearly written mandates, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And the MDR now has required that the authorized representative internally, same as that client, which is a legal manufacturer outside the EU, have each have their PRRC. So it's a very specific role. Now, when you're a smaller company, you can outsource that, right? So you can use a consultant right. to take on that role. So that's is kind of the difference between the two. Okay. The last thought that's on my mind in the moment anyway is, and, you know, going back again to my past, I know we would set up several different distributor relationships throughout the EU. A lot of times distributors would have different territories or country specific focuses and things of that nature. Is an importer sort of kind of the same way? Can I hire work with one importer to represent me throughout all of the EU? Or are there some countries Absolutely. that require, you know, certain nuances or criteria for those importers? No. So you can have multiple multiple distributors acting as an importer, or you can have one. Okay. Right? Just any one. or all so of those combinations. Any of all. So, okay. and of course, being a little bit selfish and subjective, kind of, you know, the reason why Metanvoy exists is because when you do have multiple distributors, it gets definitely a little bit oh, more challenging if you, super if you challenging. Allocate, allocate each one of them as an importer, or even one of your distributors becomes the importer, which is because they need to be 
identified on the product information, as I mentioned earlier, somewhere along the supply chain, yeah. a little bit of gray area where it should be placed, but that doesn't work very well when a commercial partner like a distributor. I, 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 yeah. No, because you don't want to have 15 different versions of labels because then it's a logistical Correct. nightmare to figure out where Correct. the product's going. So that makes sense. Yeah. Or even if you pick one distributor as your importer, the other distributors don't like to see, you know, a distributor, <laughs> you know, being as, being as the sole importer yeah. identified on the product information, right? So even though they may not have any territorial rights, contractual rights to sell anywhere else, but that was the same with the all threads representative. It just well, doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So that's the, not secret sauce per se, but the differentiator, I guess, maybe that of Met Envoy is, hey, we don't want to be distributors. We want to be importers. So you can right. keep all the relationship with your distributors. We'll take care of the compliance for Article 13 and all the other applicable Correct. language and labeling and all that sort of thing. That makes a lot Correct. of sense. And let your 3PL, your logistics provider will do the fiscal and, and often also the, yeah. the, the physical or your distributor does that. Just one thing that I forgot to mention, of course, there are also companies that sell directly from outside the EU to end users, right? You can think about okay. software your downloads sure. and everything else. So, sure. yeah. so based on my, even though I'm a history major, I don't come from law school, but when I talk to some legal scholars, obviously, so far, it seems to be that the end user cannot be responsible, cannot be an economic operator. Right. That, of course, poses a little bit of a challenge, right? If you sell directly to this end user, which could be a hospital or a patient, Right. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, now there is no importer. But there needs to be somebody responsible for placing on the market if you're manufacturing outside the EU. So therefore, that is, I think, the only times where you really can ask, now you do need to designate one because this end user cannot be an economic operator. They cannot yeah. be an importer. Does that mean now there is no importer? So we're not part of that school of thought. We think now, now you do have an issue. And, and therefore, again, a reason why we believe Met Envoy was a good alternative to make a little commercial pitch here for our service. Yeah, for sure. Rene, I, I've picked up a, a lot of good nuggets and uh, quite a bit of information that I didn't know about prior. I'm glad that we took some time to chat about the role of the importer in the EU and with respect to the MDR. Is there anything else that you think is really important or maybe uh, another tip or pointer that you want to offer our listeners before we wrap things up today? No, I think we need to stop somewhere, right? Because we can talk for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah. If we think about Switzerland as well, right? Because yeah. if we think about Brexit, right? That that is something maybe I want to leave as an important thought as well for the listeners. If they had no thoughts about it, that we all know with Brexit, okay, the nightmare that kind of mm. evolved over the last couple of years with seeing countries leaving the EU, which obviously happened with the UK. As we all know, you need to have a responsible person because the UK is now considered a third country like the US and Japan through the eyes of the right. European Union or the Union. So you need to have that responsible person, which is the equivalent of an authorized representative, European authorized representative. And you also need to have an importer in the UK, even though not clearly defined yet what this role of the importer is. We anticipate that it's going to be very similar to the MDR importer. So that's one sure. thing to consider. The other thing is Switzerland, which is our latest, greatest kind of disappointment that uh, we as the industry have to endure right now, which is, as we all know, they were working on a legislative framework within what was supposed to be the and, and mutual recognition agreement that would cover the MDR, since the MDD half of May 26 obviously is gone. So obviously that didn't happen. So now we have a similar situation without the MRA, mutual recognition agreement. Now Switzerland is a third country. It always was, but without the MRA, now it means that you need to have an importer in Switzerland as well well as a Swiss authorized representative. Oh, and wow. that's, there is a little bit of time, you know, there's no immediate panic right now. There's clear timelines defined when you need to have a Swiss AR mandated, so registered. Still some question about device registration, since as we all know, the Swiss were part of the MDR and we're going to use Unimet. Now that has disappeared. So we're waiting a little bit to get more guidance from Swiss Medic, what type of registration they will require. So th that's my last, it's not a positive thought. Like, hopefully it's a good thought that at least companies are aware of it. The well, it's complicated. Is, I think the point is it's complicated and it's very fluid and dynamic. And, you know, me as a company based outside of the UK, Switzerland, or the EU, there's some homework and due diligence that I should be doing as far as which of those regions requires an importer, which requires an authorized rep, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I think that's loud and clear. And I guess, fortunately for folks like you and I, because of these dynamics, we have lots of opportunities to try to help people navigate this because it's complicated at times. And, you know, don't, a 
assume that you can just figure it out. I mean, you might be able to, but Renee's been doing this for quite a few years. I've been doing this for quite a few years. These are our skills. These are our areas of expertise. So lean on us. I remember your beard was still black. That was... <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. I saw I a picture the other day. Yeah. I saw a picture the other day. I was like, oh my goodness, it hasn't been that long. I mean, and the crazy thing is, you know, I'm in my mid 40s and I was talking to my dad the other day and I think my beard is more white than his. And, you know, blame uh, the but... MDR. We all do. <laughs> blame the MDR. <laughs> blame the MDR. Yeah. On that, we'll let that be our final word. Renee, thank you so much. Renee Van de Zan, a partner at Med Envoy. Again, check it out, medenvoyglobal.com. Definitely the type of resource that you want in your corner. If you're outside the EU, even if you are in the EU, there might be some opportunities for the Med Envoy team to help you with market opportunities in the UK, Switzerland, and throughout the EU. As always, thank you for listening to the Global Medical Device Podcast, the number one podcast in the medical device industry. And that's all because of you, our listeners. And you know, you can also watch episodes now. We've been recording these on video. So check those out on YouTube and through the Greenlight Guru blog and that sort of thing. So check that out. This is it. Wrapping up this episode of the Global Medical Device Podcast. This is your host and founder at Greenlight Guru, John Spear. And you have been listening to the Global Medical Device Podcast. Global.